going on guys welcome back today we are finishing up our file transfers this is the last one where you only have detection and evading detection and that's it so let's talk about this for a second so they only talk about one way to do the detection but this is a very important way and that's with user agents so before we dive into it hit that like button hit that sub button we did finish the path and I am going to try and do more hack the box content um, and hopefully we can keep going down that route um, and hopefully we don't have any other issues so you can see here if you don't know what a user agent is it'll tell you right here um, command line detection based on blacklisting is straightforward to bypass even using simple obfuscation so if you change some things using that command line detection it will allow you to get around blacklisting is what they're saying okay however although the process of whitelisting all command lines in a particular environment is time consuming it's very robust and allows for quick detection this is true but it does take a lot of administration meaning if I'm going to basically only allow certain commands to be done or certain file transfers to be done and I'm blacklisting everything else this would be very time consuming for an admin because if anyone wants to transfer a file at the company stand up an application do something over here do this that whatever I have to then whitelist it and it's very time consuming um, okay most client server protocols require the client and server to negotiate how contents can be delivered right you have to know this is what I'm sending you this is how you're gonna receive it otherwise it's like speaking Chinese to uh, you know a Spanish person they're like what are you talking about right you have to say I'm gonna speak Chinese do you and if they say yep then you can talk right so this is common with the HTTP protocol there's a need for interoperability um, to, to, to do web browsers uh, HTTP clients are most readily recognized by their user agent string this is where you know what user agent you're using why because when you're looking at a web server right it has to know what user agent you're using because it, that's how it's gonna render it to you it has to know how is it going to render it to you properly so it says HTTP clients are most readily recognized by the user agent which the server used to identify the HTTP client right for example Firefox Chrome so you have to say hey I'm Firefox hey I'm Chrome whatever so it knows how to present you that data that's what we're talking about here so user agents are not only able to identify web browsers but anything acting as a web browser or HTTP client in this case connecting to the web server via HTTP like curl Python SQL map in map right Organizations can take some steps to identify potential user strings that by first building a list of known legitimate user agent strings. So, meaning if I know that, for instance, we run Firefox on our network, right? Let's just say, and I know that the Firefox user agent looks like this because I'm watching traffic of every one of my users, I can whitelist that one. I can say, hey, this one, if you see this using to access any websites, go for it. We know it's legit because it's our users, right? But if I see this one, I know it's negative, right? So we got malicious file transfers can also be detected by their user agents. Yep, said that. So here is the client. Here's the actual request. Invoke web request 1010.32 netcat.exe out file, blah, blah. So that's the actual request they're making. But then you see here's what it looks like. Get netcat.exe, right? This is on the server. HTTP 1.1 and user agent is Mozilla 5.0 Windows NT Windows PowerShell so you can see that the user agent right there if someone makes this you could put this in your blacklist and say if someone's making a PowerShell user agent request we don't want that in our environment right same with the win HTTP request they're saying hey this is what the request we sent the request here this is what it looks like it looks like Mozilla 4.0 compatibility win http dot win dot http request so you can see how you can take these user agents and use them to do two things one you can use them to detect malicious people but two you can also use them to get around some block lists because if they're blocking from the user agent then you can get around it so now we have msxml2 client and you can see when they run that look what pops up on the user agent Mozilla 4.0 compatible boom net 4.0 perfect so we know right there if we don't use that in our environment we can go ahead and blacklist that user agent cert util we talked about the cert utility before and we we actually mentioned that it was kind of um, known and people know about it but you can see the user agent is Microsoft crypto API 10.0 right off the bat we know hey we can probably blacklist that one unless we have a reason to be using it right bits again the bits you can see start bits transfer here and the Microsoft bits 7.8 is the detection 
So this is the indicators that you're looking for when you're trying to build defense. You want to look for indicators that would give you an, a chance to catch it early, right? If I can use that user agent, boom, I know for a fact I can get away with it, right? I can block them before they ever get there or I can alert myself on them. Now, changing the user agent, here's the opposite, right? We just did detection, now we're gonna flip it and say, how do we avoid that detection? Well, again, we only talked about the user agent piece here. So if we're saying, hey, if diligent admins or defenders have blacklisted any of these user agents, invoke web request contains a user agent parameter. So if they blacklisted the user agent you're trying to use, we can use invoke web request and you can see, look at all the different user agents they have. So here they have get property select name and they're just showing you the user agent ones. And you can see they have Microsoft 5, or Mozilla 5.0, which is Internet Explorer. They have Firefox, they have Chrome, they have Opera, they have Safari. So I can actually use any of these user agents and send it that way so that it thinks I'm them. Now, some people might say, well, why don't they change that? because there might be certain reasons why this is actually needed for legitimate purposes. For instance, what if I'm building an application and I need to see how it's gonna get rendered in every single one, but I don't wanna download every single one, right? I can look, I can actually run this and get the response back and I can see how it's gonna be rendered in every single one, right? Um, there's all kinds of reasons why you might need to change your user agent. Um, and in this case, keep in mind that user agents change on updates and things like that. So you might actually run into this where you whitelist a user agent and then you guys push out a new new patch or a new update for Safari, Opera, Chrome, whatever, and all of a sudden the white the user agent is block, blocked. That's because you only whitelisted the specific one and they just changed the version number. For instance, if Mozilla 6.0 came out tomorrow, right, and you only whitelisted this exact user agent, this wouldn't work, right? So you'd have to go back in and whitelist it again. So, okay, now you can see request with Chrome user agent. So here they're actually doing a user agent and they're adding Chrome right here, you see that? So they're adding that Chrome user agent and then they're doing the user or the request and look how it comes in. Even though they're using PowerShell and they did this before, right? Look how the user agent changes. Before, if you remember when we go to detection, it actually said PowerShell on it, I believe. Let's go back to it and look. You can see right here, it says Windows PowerShell in the request. But here, since they changed it to Chrome, you actually see the user agent says Mozilla Windows NT Apple WebKit Chrome. So it actually looks as though it's a completely different user agent, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. That's, like I said, it could be used for you for legitimate purposes, but when you're trying to do attacks, pay attention to what, if you know what web browsers they're using. This is why um, a lot of people say like when you're at work, don't take pictures of your computer screen, things like that, because if they can see what user agent you're using, that automatically gives them a step ahead, right? In there, there's a lot of things called um, info intelligence, right? So basically there's a lot of different ways you can do the psyops and all kinds of other things that fall into this infosec, but if you have information security, right? Take one little thing over here and it looks small. It doesn't even look like it matters to you. Like you're probably like, whatever. Take this little piece over here and be like, eh, it doesn't matter, whatever. But you piece them all together and you start to see it builds a bigger picture. In this case, this is one of them, a user agent. You might say, who cares if they know I use Chrome? Well, that alone doesn't make it matter. But if they get in and they know you use Chrome, they can now use this user agent to start transferring files and you may not realize that that was even a big deal but to them that was a big deal that helped them now transferring files with gfx download wrapper this is exactly what it sounds like it's a wrapper meaning it wraps around the packet and actually changes the the way it looks so and there's more commonly available binaries so this is a way you can actually download the wrapper exe boom boom and you can use this off living off the land binaries and then gtfo bins and you can see to, to find suitable file download binaries, right? So this, what that means is if you use a living off the land binary, then the user agent should be whitelisted because that is already on their systems. Living off the land means you're not installing anything. So you would automatically, should theoretically be able to use it. It'd be very weird for them to have a tool in their environment and then be like, but nobody can use it, right? So maybe they have it locked down to certain people, but for the most part, you should be able to use it. 
All right, so closing thoughts. As we've seen in this module, there's many ways to transfer files from our attack hosts between Linux and Windows. And it's worth practicing, practicing as many of these as possible without, throughout the modules. I agree. This is something you're going to be doing not just as a pen tester, but as an admin, as anything else. should be done all the time. So need to download a file off the target, try and impact it. So they're just recapping on what it is. But that's it, guys. We we nailed it. We we finished all of the file path or file um, transfer. And I think this is one of the most important ones to do because I see this all the time, especially in like our live streams and stuff. We get people who are like, how do I get this over to this box? How do I do this? Whatever. This showed us all the different ways. And I think it's really important that you guys try this, practice it, and let me know what you guys think. And let me know what module you'd like to see me do next in the comments below. Thanks, guys.